so nice that they have candy for us. I'm looking forward to my mouth as well. Okay, Dr. B, we're going to get started. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you for, for being here tonight and welcome to another exciting board meeting. Uh, we have a quorum tonight and we, I would like to ask um, Representative um, Brenda Gilmore to lead us in the pledge tonight. To all stand and let us repeat together the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you very much. So we'll do 30 seconds in my district and we'll start with Miss Bugs tonight. Uh, I have a few. First, I will continue to remind everyone that we're, I'm still looking for school board interns, grades 10th, 11th, or 12th. Um, I finally got my first wave of applications in, so we're so excited. I do want to give a shout out to my friend Miranda Christie, who will be helping me go through these uh, applications, as well as my cousin Kathy Bugs from Representative Jim Cooper's office. We are so excited to welcome these students to our board, have them experience this, and offer their perspective. I also would love to shout out Representative Gilmore, whose district I have just a slither of, but uh, on August 24th, we'll be at the East, the East Precinct. She'll have a town hall, and I'll be there presenting MNPS, just the, MN, the MNPS happenings and answering questions, so please be there at 6 p.m. this Thursday. Uh, I also, again, want to shout her out, because this past week I was uh, fortunate enough to sit in on a, a, the Tennessee Black Caucus Legislative Town Hall. It was very informative. Uh, concerns were addressed. Questions were asked. So great times were had by all. I um, had a great day yesterday with the uh, West End Middle School PTSO that sponsored an Eclipse Day viewing party in Elmington Park. There were hundreds of people in food trucks and a DJ and T-shirts, and it was really a remarkable experience. Uh, also at Julia Green Elementary, Janet's Planet came out and filmed Angie Kinman's second grade classroom talking about the Eclipse on Friday. So uh, I'm sure there's many more other things about the Eclipse in my cluster, but those are the two that, that I know about. Thank you. Yes. Cambridge High School celebrated their 10th anniversary on 8-11, well, they opened 8-11-08. Every month this year, Cambridge High School will host a small event to com commemorate its 10th anniversary. Um, in addition, Cambridge Elementary School, there will be a meeting held at Cambridge Elementary School on August 31st from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, to discuss the new Eagleville Elementary School. And... Um, I was able to celebrate Eclipse Day yesterday at Tennessee State University with many of our graduates from Metro National Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. 17 Maplewood Automotive students attended and completed all the assignments for the week-long training to enhance their skills and knowledge on car alignments. Uh, this was funded through Bridgestone Firestone. The training will help students prepare for the ASE certification in suspension. Congratulations to these wonderful students who strive every day for excellence and to their fabulous teacher. I'm so sorry she isn't here, TJ Williams. Thank you. Thanks. Work is coming along, uh, progressing with the Glencliff High School Athletics Complex. We're behind schedule, just like every other construction project in the city right now, but uh, we're getting there. So thank you, Mr. Henson, Mr. Prophet. And speaking of my district, District 7, I want to recognize former District 7 School Board Representative Ed Kendall, who's in the audience tonight, the longest serving uh, elected member of, of the school board. And thank you for being here. Good to see you, sir. Ms. Bird. I want to share some good news tonight from Bellevue Middle School. They had a uh, very smooth start of the year this year. Um, they had sent home a survey with, uh, parent, with parents, and the, the student feedback to parents was over 90% positive. Um, they have some exciting projects uh, going on this year. They are launching their STEAM initiative. Uh, they'll have a meeting tomorrow night at 5 o'clock about STEAM. And they also are partnering with Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is providing uh, scientists who work with Bellevue Middle students on STEM projects and uh, perform regular standards experiments with kits that Vanderbilt provides for the school. And uh, 
the virtual school enrollment at Bellevue Middle School is also growing this year. Um, they've added seventh grade. Last year they just offered seven, uh, eighth grade on virtual school, but they're including new classes uh, in wellness, Latin, Spanish, French, and PE. Um, last year there were uh, 27 students who are in credits, extra credits for the virtual school, and this year 57 students are enrolled, and, um, uh, and they also are offering uh, physical science, <coughs> excuse me, and integrated math and regular class time. Um, the virtual school did have the highest grade point average of any virtual school in Bellevue Middle, uh, in, in MMPS, Bellevue Middle had the highest grade point average, so congratulate them for that. Thank you. Dr. Brandon. Yes. I'm also highlighting the STEAM uh, initiative at um, Oliver Middle. The student teachers uh, are very excited about this initiative, and the teachers received uh, professional development during in-service week. And they're having their kickoff Thursday evening from 3 until 5. Uh, those involved will be representatives from Discovery Education and our 25 STEAM teachers. They also have at Oliver an after-school STEM club that meets twice a week. They already have 60 students involved and more on the waiting list. And finally, each grade level at Oliver has students participating in computer science and the students are already starting to create their own video games. Thank you. I just want to say a thank you and a huge shout out to Dr. Damon Cathy. Um, I see him in the back of the room back there. Um, he came out and participated in, in a, um, a meeting last uh, week and we had a really good um, show of, of people there from teachers, leadership in schools, community members, and um, just plain old parents. So um, I, I appreciate his being there and he was well received by the crowd. We're happy to have him in, our, in the McGavitt cluster. So thank you, Dr. Kathy. All right, we'll go on to governance issues um, with the consent agenda, Ms. Spearing. Thank you. Consent agenda 1A, approval of minutes 613-2017 at the regular meeting. B, awarding of purchases and contracts. One, request for proposal RFP number 17-22, Catapult Learning, LLC, Learn It Systems, LLC, Public Consulting Group, Inc. Two, Certica Solutions, Inc. Three, Hirsch Roche, Inc. Four, Institutional Wholesale Company, Inc. Five, No Sir Consulting, LLC. Six, Pencil Foundation. Seven, Public Consulting Group, Inc. Eight, Purity Dairies, LLC. Nine, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as read. Okay, um, okay. so we wanna go ahead and vote and please remember to use your iPad. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to um, item number two, Smithson Craighead Academy Renewal Application. Dr. Joseph. Thank you. At this time, I will call uh, Mr. Dennis Queen uh, up, and he will uh, discuss the recommendation for the Craighead, the Smithson Craig Academy Renewal uh, application. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, Madam Chair, Board Members, for allowing us this time tonight to present the review team's findings concerning the Smithson and Craighead Academy renewal. Charter contracts are signed for a 10-year period, 
and it is important that the review team is diligent and deliberative in their work examining the current track record and assessing the school's ability to provide the strong educational opportunities that they deserve and the operator committed to when first authorized. If they are not, they should not be renewed and we should not recommend it. Careful approval and consistent non-renewal along with the appropriate midterm closures hold the key to making sure charter schools in Nashville do not become like those in other places where the, the will to make tough decisions on school closing is lacking and poor schools uh, continue. No charter school should ever be surprised when it comes time for renewal. Our office publishes an annual report card that includes academic, operational, and financial performance for the year along with the induction of whether the school is tracking toward renewal or not based upon the record of performance. Looking at the track record of Smith and Craighead Academy, no one should be surprised that it um, will not be recommended for renewal here tonight. Once the presentation is finished, I ask that the board rule by resolution on accepting the recommendation of the review team. The review team for this renewal application was comprised of seven reviewers with a wide range of experience and familiarity with the work of Smithson and Craighead. The group was unanimous in its recommendation to not renew Smithson Craighead for another 10 year contract. Project Reflect, a little bit of a history on, on Craig, uh, Smithson and Craighead. Uh, you can read along with me. Project Reflect was founded in 1982 to serve children in poverty and transform urban America through education and education reform. Project Reflect began with a summer tutoring program called PrEP. PrEP quickly grew to a year-round effort. In 2003, Project Reflect opened Smithson Craighead Academy, the first charter school in Middle Tennessee, serving approximately 240 students in grades K-4. SCA offers children an education with an emphasis on math and literacy. The school continues to offer support in after-school program through specialized interventions and enrichment programs such as chess, art, and music. The priorities of SCA are number one, providing a safe place for all children. Number two, providing a home away from home where they receive character development and self-identity as part of a caring community. And number three, an exciting and effective laboratory for academic achievement. Renewal of an existing contract is not an automatic right and should not be considered or should be considered when a school is showing strong academic performance in both operational and financial success. TCA 4913107, Charter Law, specifically states in reviewing an application, the chartering authority may take into consideration past and current performance or lack thereof of any charter school operated by the sponsor. Once the standard of review is established, the applicant turns in their renewal application and a 10-year budget. The renewal process asks four important questions, which we will discuss in more detail on the next few slides. The review team evaluated numerous documents. Um, you may have noticed there were 100 and something sheets or forms with it, 200 and something, okay. Uh, the review team evaluated numerous documents on the basis of, for its evaluation of the criteria found in the MNPS Charter Renewal Benchmarks rubric included in your packets. And the documents include, and you can read the, do, the numerous documents that we reviewed uh, as we reviewed the application. The team then reviewed all the supporting evidence, discussed all areas of the scoring rubric, and came to a consensus, which is detailed in your packet along with detailed answers to the four renewal questions that we will be looking at. The four questions are, is the school an academic success? Number two, is the school an effective, viable organization? Number three, is the school physically sound? And number four, is the renewal plan for the 10-year charter period reasonable, feasible, and achievable? Uh, that was fiscally sound. Physically, what did I say? Physically. Okay. Uh, okay, I apologize. Smithson and Craighead Academy has applied for a 10-year contract renewal. The applicant has struggled with academic, financial, and leadership issues throughout the life of the current contract and qualifies for what we call a conditional renewal review. The review team found that Smithson and Craighead Academy does not meet the criteria for each of the four renewal questions and identified evidence for renewal benchmarks. Because of this finding, the review team recommends non-renewal for Smithson and Craighead Academy. Question number one, is the school an academic success? 
The school has struggled academically since its inception. They are in review status and on track for non-renewal currently. Three notices of concern issued 2013, 2014, 2015 on probation much of the current contract. Supports have been offered in, uh, in support of many areas of concern. We've provided supports with data specialists, data coaches, school improvement specialists, special ed, English language learner support, and we've provided access to all MNPS professional development. No, so no significant plan for addressing student achievement has been provided to us. Non-graded learning is questionable and without viable research. Use of data to inform instruction is vague at very best. Plans for supporting special populations is lacking. The overwhelming evidence of academic deficiencies, the lack of well-developed plan to correct them, and our guiding policy that schools not in excelling or achieving status on the academic performance framework will not be considered for renewal. The review team recommends non-renewal of Smithson and Craighead. A snapshot of the academic performance framework demonstrates to us that Smithson and Craighead has struggled. Um, this, this has the last two years of academic performance. Uh, if you go back further, you will also find the evidence that it has struggled. And, and with the chart in front of you, they have demonstrated negative growth on the TVOS. <coughs> the next slide, 2014-15 TVOS school-wide composite. Scoring a three puts you at state average of composite performance. Smith and Craig had has scored at a one, which is significantly below uh, state average. Math, reading, and science achievement scores from the last two testing uh, years demonstrate a further decline in outcomes. We will soon receive 2016-2017 data, but based on the school's 10-year trend data, we are really not confident that we will see much better results. Question number two, is the school an effective, viable organization? Academic results have been significantly below standard. There is not a sound plan presented for, in the renewal application for board uh, recruitment, and it is unclear on how new board members are onboarded or what training is offered to board members. There is not a solid plan for the recruitment or support of teachers. There is no staffing plan presented. There was not a solid, well-thought-out plan for student recruitment or engaging families. Technology was mentioned as a strategy, but there was no detail presented for its use, even for state assessments. The operational structure does not support the academic structure. Given the leadership instability, the lack of clear plan to recruit and train board members, the lack of a plan to recruit and train highly effective teachers, and a lack of a clear student recruitment plan, the review team does not believe the operational plan meets standard and recommends the school for non-renewal. Question number three, is the school physically sound? The school demonstrates an unsustainable financial debt and without a solid plan to retire the debt and return uh, to a solid operation uh, status is of concern. Budget assumptions are not realistic against budget numbers. Liquid assets are low and in breach of contract with MNPS. The school is over $100,000 in debt, showing few liquid assets and with projected low enrollment numbers, which have increased recently. The school finds itself in a precarious position. The submitted budget for the renewal reflects three months of cash on hand, but the most recent audit shows 37 days on hand of cash on hand. And the latest June and July financials do not reflect expected levels of cash liquidity as required by the financial performance framework. The executive director sent a request to the MNPS business office in the, in the, for an asking for an advance in the monthly payment in order to meet financial obligations. We received complaints over the summer from at least three staff members uh, having not received compensation for services. The budget excludes facilities expenses other than utilities. The budget also shows 300 to 400,000 of additional compensation yearly, but does not explain what this budget assumption is. We don't know where that money is going. Overall, the review team found the school is in a financially unsustainable position with few assets that are liquid and available. 
Due to this concern, the team finds that Smith and Craighead Academy financial plan does not meet the standard and recommends the school should be should not be renewed. The fourth question is the renewal plan for the next chapter ch next charter period reasonable, feasible and achievable. There is a long track record of poor academic performance, instability in leadership and fiscal uncertainty. The renewal application was vague and unclear. No research was given to indicate the curriculum and instructional choice were appropriate for the targeted population of students. It is unclear how the school will address its most vulnerable populations effectively. The review team does not have confidence the renewal plan is reasonable, feasible, or sustainable. In summary, there is a consistent and sustained history of poor academic performance. Financial audits reflect exceptions through all but one year. Support has been offered through the tenure of the school, significant turnover in leadership positions and on the board. <coughs> there was no clear plan presented for the renewal application for addressing deficiencies in academics <coughs> or finances. Charter renewal policy clearly states schools consistently rated as review or target on the academic performance framework throughout the life of their contract will not be considered for renewal. We respectfully ask the board to deny this 10-year renewal contract based on the evidence presented. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Harkey, it's our presentation. From here, we entertain a motion, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, we'll need a motion on the board and second it before we can have any discussion. Does anyone want to make a motion? Motion is just for discussion. I make a motion that we accept the recommendation from, I know your name, <laughs> office. Mm -hmm. Charter. From the Charter Office. Yes. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. All right. And so, discussion, questions? Okay, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, so for a while I thought about abstaining from this vote because I actually started my career at Smith & Craig at the middle school. Um, during that time, there was a lot of transition. There was a lot of turnover. In the two and a half years that I was there, we had four different administrators. Um, it was inconsistent at best. Um, but I will say, the middle school was very separate and very different than the elementary school. We went over there. I went over there just a couple times to visit with friends, and it was very different. When I look at the Tennessee report card data uh, for 2012 and 13, and I know that was years ago, but for 2012 and 13, they were a level five. Uh, they were level three in literacy, a level five in numeracy, and a level three overall. And I think back to my time at Neely's Bend, that is always what I go to when I think about uh, renewing or not renewing a charter school, and I think about the transition that our students were in, because looking at the data, we had not done well, but our growth was high, we were moving the needle, and the idea that we were going to be disrupted in that growth to allow something different to happen was unsettling. So I would like to see them turn around. Um, I could also use this time to kind of sit on my soapbox and praise them for having so much uh, minority representation in their administration. The idea that 90 to 95 percent of their students are uh, low SES and students uh, students that are minorities and their teaching population, their administration reflects that. I just, again, remember as a teacher how frustrated I was as an African American teacher. It was kind of a running joke that you couldn't really move up in MNPS. So the idea that uh, Smithson Craighead consistently recruits and retains administration administrators of color is definitely to be commended. Um, but I, I'll say that looking at the last couple of years of data, I would like to see what 16, 17 data looked like to see if there was any kind of turnaround or if this level one that we saw in 14, 15 was the most recent and, you know, if that growth it has been, if that lack of growth was sustained. Ms. Berry. I want to say that Project Reflect and Smith and Craighead is the type <clears throat> of charter school that, um, that I'm very proud of because uh, they take the lowest performing kids. 
and those teachers love those kids. Sister Sandra loves those kids. They don't cherry pick. They don't ask students to leave if they don't look like they're going to do well on the exam. So um, I went to Smithson Craighead today, which is in my district. And uh, I'd, been, I'd been to Smithson Craighead in the past, and I felt like uh, what I saw today was exceptional, and they have come a long way. Um, I saw um, second, third, and fourth grades. And in those grades, <coughs> teachers were teaching. They were on their feet. Uh, every child in second, third, and fourth grade that I saw, they were on task. They were engaged. The pacing was excellent. Now, I was there probably in each of those classrooms for about 10 minutes. But I was impressed. And I'm not easily impressed when I go into a school. So I, I, I commend you for what I saw today. Uh, students were well behaved in the in, inside the classroom, outside the classrooms. The school was clean. I'm very impressed with the principal, Mr. White. Um, he's only been hired a, a few months since July, and he came from Hunter in Sumner County. Uh, he was the executive principal. He's been an executive principal in several schools uh, for 10 years. And uh, he has, in this short amount of time, he selected his, his staff. Uh, he has, um, he said he's got some more decisions to make about some staff, but he, he has been very successful in school turnaround. Um, he moved the math scores at Hunter uh, up 20 points and uh, in ELA, 10 points. Very impressive. Uh, they have begun a writing program with Lucy Calkins that I'm very familiar with and, and I think highly of. Uh, the technology is, is, you know, it sounds good. They, all, the compu all, all the third and fourth grade students have computers, their own individual computer. Um, they have a community school there. Uh, it, it's, it's becoming more and more of a community school. And they offer free music lessons to their students. Um, have soccer, have ball fields, and we've got 191 families that go to Smith's and Craighead. Um, so uh, I would like to see the school stay open. Any other comments, questions? Ms. Springston? I agree with everything that uh, Ms. Spearing said, and um, I think that if the school stays open, I think that as a district, we ought to commit to partnering with them to provide the kind of structured supports that are going to be necessary going forward. They, they're one of the good guys, and, um, and uh, I think depending on how this goes, we need to be prepared to do more. I had a question. Okay. So um, I think you, you referenced earlier supports that the central office had provided. Yes, ma'am. Can you go back to? Yeah, I mean, we present, we've provided over the course of years uh, a number of supports around data coaches. Uh, federal programs have been in to work with staff, uh, special ed support, uh, English language learner support. Uh, so we, we have provided a number of uh, areas of district personnel going in trying to support the work in the school itself. And what's the current enrollment? Uh, it was last I checked, it was 180 something, but 191 then. And capacity would be? Uh, they have a 250. It's 250 is their cap. And do we have any data that shows the students, are, they've been open 10 years, so we've got a couple cohorts that have made it out of the elementary tier. Um, do we know where those students go, how they perform? <coughs> we haven't done an analysis around that. With a renewal uh, or a possible re uh, consideration, is it possible for a temporary renewal? Uh, or do we have to do the whole 10 years? It, it's a 10-year. Uh, we can't put any type of conditions on a 10-year, so it would be a full 10-year. Um, renewal on it. We can't do any, any provisional things with it. 
Can I ask? And then Ms. Uh, because I was under the impression that we could always pull a charter school for review. So let's say we got the 1617 data, we end up with 1718 data, and uh, we don't see any growth. Could we then pull them for review, or would we still have to wait the 10 years? The charter office has the authority to do what we call a hard review in the midst of a contract, but the, the level that you have to get to is much higher than just a simple renewal, renewing a contract. So if we do it within the midst of a 10 year, it's a much higher standard. Um, so it's possible, but it's a much higher standard if you want to, if you come back for a closure. You mean it's a higher standard to close it or they have to meet a higher standard to it's remain a higher, open? The, the evidence has to be, a, a, it's a very high standard to close the school in the middle of a contract. Usually you will find gross um, uh, misappropriations, things that are very serious that you would come back for. If it's a lack of academic performance, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to close the school in the middle of a contract just for that. Well, that was kind of my question. I'll, I just, I'll just add, I, you know, we cut a hard bargain with charter schools because they are judged on these test scores, but it's difficult to determine sometimes how the schools are getting the test scores. And this is a school, I love their mission. They are there to serve children in poverty. They keep all kids. They don't kick anybody out. They are not cherry picking. Um, and I think that they are unique in our, our charter sector because they truly came in trying to collaborate with the district. You know, uh, Dr. And Mr. Henson was uh, doing their books for their audits for a while. So, I mean, I really believe they are trying to partner with the district and also trying to serve our diff difficult populations and that they are, um, they are representative of the true, uh, the, the original intent of charter schools. Um, and so I guess that's, I understand, you know, if the performance doesn't come up, obviously there have been a, a lot of positive changes recently, um, what would prevent us if we did determine for the 10-year period is over? I know you say it's a higher standard, but what is that? I don't, I don't really know. What does that mean? It's, do we have, they have to have a certain level of performance for us to shut them down? It, or? Yeah, it would, it would have to be something pretty critical that occurs uh, to bring a school in the midst of a 10-year contract. Uh, we could not come simply for one or two years worth of poor performance, particularly after a renewal where we've said, we're gonna give you a 10-year additional period. If you come back in two years, you're looking at two years worth of data. So it typically is something at a much, it's a much higher standard. I mean, if, if, the, school, if the school's unable to pay salaries, for example, we could bring it in immediately. We could close them immediately. Uh, if they couldn't staff, I mean, there's certain things we could bring it back, but for just to come back and say, well, let's look at one or two more years worth of data, you can't necessarily close the school based on that if you've renewed them for another 10. Yeah, and, and the I issue the was other, there initially. Yeah, and I think the other issue is that we have, we're missing two years of data on the school. And I know that they've had chronic issues, but um, you know, I think we're all, would hope that they will improve because their mission is good and Based. I have a question. Okay, Ms. Pierce. And then Dr. Gentry. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, so, what's the chances of us getting the data in any? I mean, so, do we have to make the decision tonight? And if we don't, is there any chances of us getting the data? So, here's my concern. And, you know, this is always tricky, right? You know, because we're all having a very emotional discussion about this. And we've got 191 kids um, that we need to be having a discussion about. And so I just want us, you know, sort of like the caution we got earlier in the executive committee. We renew this, renewing this says we are willing to accept the, behavior, the performance that we have seen over the past 10 years. That's what it says. Now, it, we can say that we hope, given the changes that have been presented in this report, that things will get better. But the renewal says we're willing to accept the risk that they won't. Okay, um, and so when I asked about, you know, I see the faces in the audience. When I asked about the support that we've already given, the question becomes, if someone says we'll support them, well, what more do we do? What is it that we haven't done? And so I would also ask that if we renew this, I would be interested in knowing what is the plan from your office sure. to provide additional support. It's interesting. Uh, you don't have to answer that now. I mean, <laughs> but that's, that's, so I think we need to be respectful and fair and consistent in how we review this charter school as we are with others 
to say if we're willing because they are doubling down on the kids that need it the most, they are putting the resources and there are teachers there who wanna be there, right? So obviously they wanna be there with the kids that they're serving and there's a need for it. But we've gotta be, if we're saying to Mr. Pinkson's point that we're gonna help them even more, we need to be very clear about what more help looks like, what more help costs, and what we expect to see as a result of more help. Okay? And then understanding, to his point, because a renewal implies to the outsider that I'm willing to go along on this ride for 10 more years, it is gonna be harder to say, oh, I did see the two years of data, to the missing years of data it's two weeks from now and it didn't look good. Hopefully it does look a lot better. Or five years from now, the data isn't where we want it to be. You can't turn around and say, I wanna get off this, 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 this bag of wagon. So if we're in, we gotta be all in. And we gotta understand what that additional support for Smiths and Craighead is gonna look like and what we expect to see as a result of that. Ms. Pearson and Mr. Pinkston. I, I, I think what I'm, um I'm struggling with is I don't think anyone at this table takes pleasure in this discussion. Um, it's never a positive conversation to, to have to, to take a look at this hard information and, and in your recommendation. Um, my goal from day one is for great schools. And I want us to all be very consistent in how we use the data that we have and how we use the academic performance framework. And it can't be because we think they're one of the good guys that we're willing to accept this, these bands of scores consistently for a decade, but for another charter, it's game over because we have this, this policy in place that says after three years of consistently low performing data, so it sends a very confusing message. Um, I, again, I take no pleasure in my, in my, my question is really for what is the future for the, the children there now? Where, where are the schools that they will be where are they mainly zoned to? Um, what are we offering them in, in the future? And then I would also make a, a huge request for future renewals that we are looking at what happens to the children when they leave, especially if they're at, a, at an elementary, middle, or whatever. How did they leave? How did they enter and how did they leave? That is, a to me, a key question that we're not asking informing these renewals because if we knew for 10 years of, of graduates of Smith and Craighead that another middle school received these children and they, they were just as far behind or, or were they on grade level? I mean, that, those, are, those are key data points. But what, is the, what, are, what are the schools that they're zoned to? Um, how do they perform on this performance framework? And, uh, and let's be consistent, guys. We gotta have great schools for our kids. Mr. Pinkson and then Ms. Bates. Well, can he answer oh. the oh, I'm sorry. schools they're zoned to? question. It's a question of where they're zoned to and what, it, what is the plan? Yeah. Well, we, um, in anticipation, we did work with the uh, student assignment office there. I don't have it in front of me to, to show where those students would be going. So I don't have, I can't share that with you tonight. We can get that to you. Uh, we have not done an analysis of the performance levels at the schools they would move to. Uh, we can certainly get that to you as well. Uh, but um, the support mechanism, uh, it's interesting, Carol and I were having a discussion just this afternoon about tier three schools or schools who are in line for closure and just far can we intervene to support them because at the end of the day, the, the charter law does not give us the authority to instruct them around curriculum or instruction. All we can do is support it, monitor it. Uh, we can engage in conversation, we can provide opportunity, but we can't force a charter school to take our support. We just can't do it by law. Uh, so we would simply do what we've been doing and continue to have conversation around what we can provide you to help you. But again, we can't force that on a charter school. They can take it or leave it. <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Gentry, I would suggest if, if you know, if this the board decides to keep the school open that that someone consider inviting them into the L5 fold where it really is highly structured uh, sets of interventions not just kind of the light touch technical assistance that they've gotten historically so I think kind of picking a moment to, to innovate and and create some partnership opportunities and if they don't want to do that then then you know we could perhaps revisit the decision but uh, that's that's the, the kind of highly structured support that I'd be talking about is that similar to a takeover? Uh, you want to talk about the L5, Dr. Joseph? 
Yeah, we would not be able to uh, incorporate them into our, our priority uh, zone under under our, um, you know under our current rules. I mean, we could, you know, I, I agree with. Uh, Ms. Pierce, as she talks about the fact that I mean, we need great schools in, in our in our district, and you know we've we've got lots of work, you know that that needs to happen uh, pervasively across 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 the district. I mean, our, our children, you know, deserve excellence, and you know I do I can commit to agreeing to uh, figure out how we better collaborate uh, with. Uh, you know, Smiths and Craig Hague, as well as all of our, our charters. I mean, I think we've got to look at how do we elevate the level of, um, you know, education in Metro Nashville public schools, you know, collectively. And if there are great things happening in, in one pocket of the, the city, the question becomes how do we scale it, uh, you know, as a district. And it's, it's been conversations we've begun uh, last year. And, and, and I will say, uh, the you know, administration at Smiths and Craig Hague has been very collaborative with the district, and they have been you know, willing to be uh, supportive. And you know, they have, you know, uh, taken feedback and, and have followed through when we've worked. But we must, you know, it's it's we we've, we've got to answer this question today. And based upon the you know the recommendation uh, is based upon the criteria you know that we have established. And at this time, we've got to answer the question it just without, without anything, looking at the data, looking at the, uh, their performance, uh, looking at the financials, the four areas we talked about. Are they, uh, at this time, you know, ready for renewal? And from our position at this time, you know, the answer was no. But this is the power of you know, the community and the board. I mean, there are other things. I mean, there are other things besides test scores that make a great school. I mean, but test scores are important. I don't want to diminish that. Um, but, you know, there are lots of factors that play in, and I think that's why this discussion is robust and healthy. Um, and it's never an easy decision. Uh. Ms. Bugs and then Ms. Pierce. So I had some questions uh, about the academic performance. Did you all only look at TVA scores, or were you looking at other, maybe map data or anything else? Map data we did not. We don't control the environment around map testing and charters like we do in the traditionals. So we do not look at map data as an indicator. Plus, map is really designed to form instruction, not to assess levels. Uh, the only thing that we really look at are the things on the performance, which is primarily the TVOS or some other indicators we look at as well uh, on the, the broader framework. But TVOS carries a lot of weight. And uh, just so I'm clear, TVI scores are typically just third and fourth grade scores. I mean, I know there are other things that go into yeah. kindergarten, first and second grade, but third and fourth grades are the only ones tested. Sure. Okay. Here's the center. Right. So obviously with this recommendation, it was much broader than test scores. Um, tell me a little bit more about the fiscal. There, um, the, the concerns we had, they, they've had exceptions or issues with every audit minus one year over the 10-year contract. So nine years they had exceptions in their audits that they had to go back and correct or modify or, or, or clean up. Um, more recently, uh, three staff members this summer contacted us and said, I haven't been paid. Of course, all we can do is refer them back to the school, so there's concerns. The executive director at the time contacted the district asking that they get an advance on their monies in order to uh, continue. Um, and uh, when they submitted their budget to us, it didn't correlate with their plan. Uh, and there were some, some monies that we couldn't identify where it was going. So there were some holes in the budget itself. And we had uh, uh, Brian Hall work with us, uh, with the district, to really try to dig through that and figure it out. So uh, we just have concerns. I understand the school has a structured loan that they've now negotiated. Um, with some of the properties that they own. Uh, we're concerned that that's a temporary one-time infusion of monies. So the sustainability of funding the school, of, of paying teachers, there's, there are some real concerns there uh, that they could actually fulfill that. Ms. Hunter? So I'm thinking, this reminds me of, what was it, a year ago, we were talking about the Napier 
elementary school and we were trying to decide whether or not we were gonna let Napier stay in the Napier community or we were gonna allow it to be taken over. And um, we were trying to decide whether or not we were gonna give the teachers and the principal there an opportunity to do what they felt like they could do. Um, so this really feels no different. And then I also think about um, like Antioch High School, Overton High School, which are traditional metro schools are both experiencing losses of teachers right now, high loss of teachers. And then I, when you look at the academic framework, for years many of us have sat on this board and we've sat in schools were low performing for several years and we can't close those schools so um, and I don't know what we do about it but um, I would just say that the district itself is um, we're expecting great expectations now we're going in a different direction and I talked to Dr. Jackie Mitchell give her a shout out and I have a lot of respect for her and she's been speaking with me over the past couple of years about the changes that the school has been experiencing and I do feel personal because I had a child that, that attended Smithson Craig Head and he had an injury and I remember Sister Sandra coming and sitting at his bed at the hospital and just sitting with him for hours. Um, and I've also experienced those, that same nurturing through um, Republic schools. Um, so I, I, I don't like the, the charter back and forth that we experience because I don't think it's about that. I think it's really about the children and you know how um, we care for our children, making sure that they're learning. And I think that's a goal for all of us at this table and also all of them that sit at that table. So I just want to say, I want to point those things out um, just to make sure that we consider when we're making these choices that we also have schools in our district that we've been responsible for and we've just not done the things that we have needed to do to make those changes in our traditional public schools as well. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I can say anything more, but I just want to make those points. Thank you. <clears throat> The, as has been said, I mean, the issue here is that we're having to make and we're being asked to make an objective decision, but there's a lot of subjectivity. I mean, you know, we most of, if not all of us, know somebody at the school or have experienced the school or have met with Sister Sandra. So we, there is that understanding of the love that comes from and through the school. At the same time, though, um, we don't want to set. A precedent, or you know, lower any expectations to allow a one-time. I don't know. I, th th that's why it's so hard because you, you do. I, I do understand, and I'm, I'm sure the other board members do understand that elementary schools are hard. They're hard to test because, again, you're only testing two grades. So it's hard to say that academically they're not doing well when we don't know what those students are coming in kindergarten with. You know, are, do they even know shapes and colors? Do they know how to identify numbers? So. It, elementary school is just it's hard to look at academically, but there is definitely a concern when you talk about fiscal responsibility and making sure that uh, one of our most precious commodities after our students are our are, are, are faculty, our teachers, the, the, the custodians, you know, the people that have to get paid. So the fear that, um, you know, worst case scenario, you show up one day and your school isn't open because, you know, there's no money. Um, I do think that has to be considered also. So this is just a tough one because we want to see them thrive and we don't want to disrupt a student's, um, a student's matriculation. But at the same time, these are kind of alarming things to consider. All right. Anybody else? So the question I asked about when the data would be available. When the what? The data, data. that we don't have. We could potentially get it within the week. It would be up to research to pull it together for us and sort it. Are you talking about the test score data that? Yeah, so 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 let me preface that. Yes, so that's what I'm talking about. So those two those two years of data that were missing, and so I think that the and again I agree with you know a lot of what's been said here, um, but you know we have policies, so it doesn't have to be hard. We have policies, so it doesn't have to be work based on what you feel or what you think or what you hope is going to happen. We have policies for a reason, so that we can review every charter application, every charter renewal with that, through that lens. Um, so again, my question is, do we have to make the decision today? And will we be able to get the data in enough time to maybe have a special call meeting if necessary? Because if we're talking about three years of performance, which is what our policy says, I don't think we have three years, right? We don't have a rolling three years of data that's out there somewhere, 
but we don't have it. And so we're being asked to make a decision with incomplete information. I can't even apply the policy unemotionally because I don't have the information in front of me. I would have to um, ask counsel to address that. In terms of the timeline, I didn't bring my TCA, but there is a timeline attached to this. I'm, being, I'm sure there is. And I'm being told that we're on day 25 out of 30, so we're already kind of at the end of it. Um, so, so, yes, there is a timeline, and yes, we are under the gun to get it done. And Dr. Chang is probably can address when we would anticipate the current testing to come. Not anticipating the, the new state results until probably October. There's because 2017 was the first year of the 10 ready assessment. Uh, the state has been uh, establishing new performance standards. So that data we haven't received even the preliminary data at this point. Ms. Brooke, I would just also caution that we're not going to have 2016 data because the testing platform failed. So we're really we'd be looking at one year. And, gap and then another. Yeah, yeah, and then <clears throat> the other difficulty, like I said, is this, you know, I think this school serves a unique population of very low-income students that, you know, there's, they're taking everybody. They're taking children with very high needs. So it doesn't surprise me that they are struggling with some of the, the, the testing. Um, but, you know, um, it's not to say that it can't be overcome. I think, you know, with a lot of support and particularly the community schools efforts, uh, you know, I'd love to see this, the population at this school have those sorts of community school supports. And, and I was not aware until Ms. Spearing said tonight that they are working on that effort. But that's, I think that would be very beneficial to this particular population that they're serving. Is it okay, I would like to ask if there are any of the board members or someone just to speak to us, to let us know some of the changes that have been put in place? I think you need to ask your chair if that's or, permissible. Okay, yes, is, it, is that, that permissible, any chair? Of, any other I'm not sure that, um, oh, we can legally do that? In the report? You, you, you can, but you need to let me do it. Okay. You don't have to. Okay. I would like to ask that they participate. I just, we, because we're, we want to know, and it's, I don't, if they're here and we really are serious about trying to gain more information so that we can make the most informed decision, I, I would really like to hear from, I just really want to hear from them, and I don't know how the other board members feel, but if that's okay with Anna, I would appreciate it. Um, yeah, if we can get that information in five minutes or less so, so we can go ahead and vote on this. Um, do we have a- We got at least two out there, I see. Yeah, we have a board member here or, okay. Well, what, okay, so board members are nice. I love us as a board, but I also, if we're going to listen to board members, I would much rather hear from a teacher. Oh. Well, so I'm, when, I mean, if you lost, yeah. I just asked the principal is here tonight. The principal is here tonight. Mr. White. Mr. Principal, Mr. White, I chair the corporate membership that controls the assets and the finance side. So if you'd like to talk to him about academics, that would be the appropriate thing. Finances. If Mr. White could come up and, and address the board, that would be awesome. Good evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, where do we start? You know, one of the things, I guess I'll tell you about me, and then I guess I, and now hopefully I'm going to start to address some of those things as well that you need to know. I, I left a, a very comfortable position where I was as an executive principal because I wanted to work with the students in my community. I live in Madison, Tennessee. I live three minutes from Smiths and Craighead Academy. And right now, my sons, I have three boys that are at my home, they've gone to school with me in Sumner County. They go to school with my wife in Sumner County. But the kids they play with in the neighborhood, they are the ones that go to Neely's Bend, Smithson Craighead, Madison. And I want those students to have an opportunity to see the things or have the opportunities that my sons have in Sumner County. And I'm not saying I'm a savior. I can't do that. I can't walk on water. I know people think I may can, but I can't. But one thing I know how to do is work with children. I love children. I've been given an opportunity many times to work with students, both from White's Creek to White House, and, and had a great opportunity to do that and, was, and found great success. Not because of anything I've done special, but I believe in the people that are around me. One of my jobs as an administrator is to make sure I get the best and brightest teachers out there and put the things in place to make sure that my students get a good, solid education. 
I can't I can't speak to the history of, of Smiths and Craighead and the aspect of some of the practices and things of that nature. But what I can speak to is what's going on right now. Since I've taken over at Smiths and Craighead, we balanced the, we we passed a balanced budget um, on my on our first meeting. That was my first Thursday uh, in in my position, and we were able to pass a balanced budget. That's the first time that's happened uh, after that I know of during my time. And we also trimmed a lot of the fat. There were some things that there were some things that we had to cut out. We are we are running on exactly what's needed at Smiths and Craighead. There's some positions that we had to get rid of. There's some positions that we had to cut. Some of my staff members decided to stay on and take by taking a pay cut because they're dedicated to our children, because they love our children. Our children hear that on a daily basis. Not only did we do that, we know that there were some issues with, with when we looked at our budget. So I'm already in, in process of switching and moving to a different program that is used by more of the other charter schools in Ed Tech or either Sandy Cove, Sandy Cave. So we, we've taken those suggestions from the charter office and I've give, been putting those things into uh, practice. So every suggestion I've been given since July, I've worked with the charter office to make sure that we have the opportunity to fulfill those things, to make sure that we can stay open. I didn't, I didn't take a ch chance on SCA because I thought it was gonna be this great opportunity to just jump out and do something miraculous. No, I jumped in SCA because I believe in the mission. I believe in the vision of this school. When you walk down the halls, and we had the wonderful opportunity to have Ms. Spearing in today, when you walk down the halls, you see children. You know, I think we talk about the test scores. We, we don't take sometimes into consideration that some of the students that we have are coming from other metropolitan schools coming in and they're being tested. We, we talk about test scores, we think about some of our, our students are coming from Belshire and English Bend and other places and they're coming to our school because this is their last chance. And I want to make sure that it's the best opportunity they can get. Again, our interim executive director, Mr. Faulkner, yes, he secured opportunities for us to make sure that we're on solid financial footing. We have people that are, are invested in SCA. All we're asking for, we're, I'm, not, I'm not asking for you to rewrite anything. I'm asking you for you to give me a chance. Give me a chance to work with these children. You know, I, I'm not, anyone that knows me, I'm not the huggy, touchy-feely person, but I promise you this, I've probably gotten 100 hugs a day, and, I, and it's starting to, you know, make my little hairs grow, those that are left. <laughs> but I'm, what I'm saying is, it's an opportunity to, to, to believe in children. Every day my children hear this, and that's what I'll, and I'll, I'll end with that, because I know you have a short amount of time. Every day my children hear, I love you, I believe in you, and there's nothing you can do about it. And no matter what you decide today, I'm gonna to still love these children and I'm gonna believe in them even if no one else does. And there's nothing anyone can do about it because they deserve it. They deserve the best. And, I, and that's what I'm trying to give them. Thank you, Mr. White. I have a question. Okay, I have a few. <clears throat> Ms. Bugs first and then Dr. Brandon. So I have questions, specific questions, like um, about maybe your intervention plans, discipline plans. Is there any uh, liter literacy or STEM focus in your grading policy? Yes, ma'am. So what we've gone to is more traditional policy on, on, on just how we grade our students, making sure that they're, they're standards-based. So we're looking at, are we, are we grading students on the standard? And so what I mean by that, as we're moving into that direction and starting in that, that um, arena of standards-based grading and everything, we're starting to make sure that, one, our teachers understand and fully engage into the standard. Do the students know what they're learning and what they're being expected to learn? So that's the first thing that we're working towards in that area. Another thing that I've put in place in the short time that I've been there, we put a time away room. Of course, we don't send a child out. We don't kick a child away. But what we have done, because we've um, purchased um, iReady for our students, um, which is a much more cost-efficient program than the previous program we had. We had Let's Go Learn, and we, and we were able to get iReady, and actually we got it pretty reasonably because we were able to pilot it. So the uh, only thing I pay for is training for that. But we have that in a computer lab, which is our time away room. So students are able to go in there and work on some of those skills that they need that's individualized for them so we can drill down to those, um, those are the core needs of those students that are in there. And they're not sitting there for a whole day, three days, four days. We send them in there as time, the time needed so we can walk in there, talk with the child, we process with them, we work those things out so we can get them back into the classroom. But anyone knows that if I have one child that's in the classroom that's not behaving properly, he can throw everything off of the other 21 students. So this is this time away opportunity is a time to move that student away so we can transition them back eventually into the classroom setting so that that child can be successful, but also make sure that's not they're not doing some write-offs or some ditto sheets. They're actually working on something that they can do um, at their level and to push them, because a lot of times those behaviors come 
from a frustration from lack of ability in reading and things of that nature. So we have that. We also talked about the Lucy Calkins uh, writing program, which is one that we're implementing for our school, because another thing we want to make sure our students are able to write. We want to make sure they're able to, writing helps out with their creativity. It helps them with their thinking. It also helps them to, to really process those things that they just learned. So giving them that opportunity to write and uh, put those things in place with those programs. And then just also just going back into what's effective what's working for our students. So in one of our first PDs that we had this year, uh, right before school started, we started going into that John Hattie's research and what's effective um, um, for our students in that visible learning. And so, so we're looking at our practices and saying, how effective is homework? How much growth does that give you as a teacher? So those are some of the things that we're working towards. And the interventions? Uh, as far as, um, so you just want behavioral interventions, uh, academic? academic interventions. So what we what we want to do, and what we, of course you know you have to we look at RTI and the tier one, tier two, tier three students. What we what we've done is we've actually increased hours for some of our staff members to make sure we can fully implement um, extra time because in our our population, our tier threes run a little bit higher than should what what normally would be a tier three student. So what we've done is making sure that we have enough fat staff to cover those needs of those students. So then our core teachers, uh, content teachers, the 10 core teachers, they can work with those students directly to help drill down on their um, specific work while the other students in tier two and tier one get some of the academic needs that they that they have as well. So intervention-wise, we're, we're assessing where they are and we have several tools and then we're gonna start working through that. Another thing that my teachers are doing to address that is our common formative assessment, CFAs. And with our common formative assessments, that's one that our teachers will make they'll be able to, in their PLC time, look at a child and say, this is how this child is working, this is what they were able to do on this skill. And then with that skill, they can then separate the child they need to during the, um, their one-on-one -on -one time or the time they're doing their centers, so they can actually group the students by ability needs and put them in the places where they can get the intervention and the help that they need. Thank you, Dr. My Brandon. question was around oh. curriculum, oh, and okay. so, right. um, and the, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Chris uh, Smithson Craighead is a nurturing environment, a safe environment, and that you're dedicated uh, to students and the community. And I'm sure that you do a, quite a bit in building self-esteem of students. My, my main concern is the achievement. Now, but we're accountable for uh, the achievement and um, uh, I have a history as well with Smithson Craighead. Uh, that's my main concern, uh, building the achievement of students. And so um, I'm wondering if you're willing to, to uh, stipulate that you're going to work with, if you are approved for renewal, that you will definitely work with the system in uh, the uh, suggestion that my colleague made. Yes, ma'am, 100%. Um, Mrs. Bannon, one of the things I said when I um, embarrassingly had to introduce myself at the administrator's, uh, new administrator's meeting with um, the board a few years, a few weeks ago, is I had to tell people who I am and what I believe. And I believe if it's not good for children, it's not gonna work, it's not good for anyone. And so if those, so what, what I'm saying is, working with MMPS benefits our children. So therefore, it's going to be, if it's going to benefit them, it's good for them, it's good for me. And I'm willing to work. And I think that Mr. Queen and uh, Ms. K Ms. Swan can tell you, in, when, when they've had interaction with me, I've jumped on everything they've asked me to do in the aspect of what's best for Smiths and Craighead, but also trying to move this ship forward and doing the right things that we can do. I, I want that to happen for our school. And on occasion, we have had some of our uh, cha uh, charter schools to realize that in spite of what they're doing, they cannot operate. Uh, are you willing to look, I don't want to be pessimistic, I understand. but um, are you willing to be aware of when that time might come? Yes, ma'am, one of the things I believe, you, you have to to my own self be true. As I said when I stood up, I'm no one savior, but one of the things I do know how to do is be honest with myself. I know where my shortcomings are, I know I'm not, you know, I, I learned at an early age I wasn't going to the NFL or the NBA, 
<laughs> and I learned that I wasn't, you know, going to make it to the movies because of my good looks. But I do know that oh, it's what's best for children and work in education. If that happens, I'll be just as honest as I am about my NBA career, my NFL career, my good looks, and I'll say that this is not working. And, and I'll be willing to step away because I don't want to do anything that hurts a child. I don't want to do anything that hurts our school and hurts and, and is a detriment. I think that what we can do at Smith and Craighead is positive. I think what we can do is good for our community, good for our children. Me, well, obviously, being a black male and my young boys, and they can see me, both boys and girls can see me as a positive role model. Those things are good, but if, it, if I also have to be a man enough to say, this is not working, and, and I'm willing to walk away if I have to, to make sure that those children get the best opportunity. And one other question. Uh, how many new board members do you have? Right now, we just, we've just brought on three new board members um, in our last board meeting, and um, very qualified, very good uh, people to come on our board. Uh, three of how many? Um, three of, we have 11. 11. That, yes, it has it at 11 right now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yeah, just to um, pull a thread on what Dr. Brandon was saying, if, if you all guys get another chance here, please be prepared to run, not walk, um, to, to look for the additional supports. And to the folks on our end, please be prepared. <laughs> To receive that and think outside the box and um, and uh, explore, you know, some of the ideas we've talked about around this table. So, will you run? Oh yes, sir. I'm ready. I have my run issues on. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I want to jump in and correct something from before. Um, you um, sorry. I once the question came up about timelines, I wanted to make sure that we got it right. There, the provision in the state law actually gives us until a decision has to be made on or before the following February 1st. So we do have some time. It was the idea that you wanted to give a little bit of um, time for the students that are in the school to think about closure. So I did at least want to correct that. We don't have that very short timeline that I thought. Back like in February 2018. February 1st of 2018. If they submitted their application later, no later than April 1st of the year prior to the year in which the charter expires. So yes, they have till the February 1st of the following year, which is 2018. So my question was, um, teachers, have you filled all of your vacant teacher positions? Yes, ma'am. We have all of our teacher positions filled. Um, we also even, even all the way down to EL, and I know that's been in trouble in a lot of different places. I've been calling different districts and trying to find EL teachers, but we actually found a wonderful <laughs> EL teacher to uh, to come over. So we are we are fully staffed. Did you take our teachers? <laughs> <laughs> How do I say this? No, <laughs> no we borrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, could I speak? Okay, sorry. Um, I think you brought up a very interesting point, Ms. Gentry, that uh, the fact that we don't have two years' worth of data, it makes it hard for us to make a very objective decision. It makes it hard for us to look at data and policy and say they haven't made a turnaround. Um, the, what we've seen isn't great, but I think it, it just, I would like to see data. I would like to see this year's data, or this past year's data, I'm sorry. So can I rescind my motion? Yes. I'd like to do that. Okay. Is that okay? Thank you. I'd like to do that. Uh, and I'd like to make a motion for deferral um, with the expectation of receiving a few additional pieces of information. So first I'd like to make my motion for deferral, um, and then I'd like to kind of to you, Mr. Queen uh, and Mr. White, or Dr. White, talk about some of the things we'd like to see, and then when we would be prepared to bring it back for a vote. Second. Second. All right, so we have a um, first motion was rescinded. We have a new motion on the floor to um, delay the, the vote, no date given, and it's been properly seconded. Does anyone have any discussion around the second? Yes, Do we need to? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I would just say that bef uh, when a deferral date is set, that it be in time for families to m participate in the choice application process should a negative decision be made. Good point. Ms. Bugs? Um, so do we need to go ahead and stipulate what information we yes. want? Because so we just vote on the thing yeah. first. Okay. Yeah. Did you have I, I, I'm not sure that I heard everything that was said. So if, if I'm uh, repeating something, please forgive me. Uh, but um, I hope that this school will be able to stay open. I, I, I'm my only concern about the deferral is that uh, we, if something 
if, if this board chooses to close the school, we want to give the parents as much time as possible. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, that was okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good point. Any other comments, questions around the new motion on the floor? Okay, we have a, um, then please vote. It's on your iPad. Hmm. You say so. Um, I feel like Chris Tucker's character in the fifth, the sixth, the fifth element. I got the broke one. It's gone. It's gone. Well, look at here. <laughs> Must you find it? I don't know. Is real broken. Go back there, girl. You close your window. Mm -hmm. She needs help. She needs help. But you need to come help her. She needs help. <laughs> Having technical difficulties. Okay. Okay. So unanimous vote to um, defer the um, the um, d d uh, the recommended of the um, SCA renewal application. So it passed unanimously. And so once we um, we have we given. Mr. So I think that now we just want to discuss some of the things that came up. So I know that um, there was a fiscal concern, and then there's the test data, and then there's for me, what does this additional support? Uh, look like and so if there's a something that can come back I don't know how long it would take to pull that together and then come back to the board so we we will work with the school uh, we would like a little direction from the board as to specific data you're interested in reviewing uh, I was just we were just talking to mr. white about uh, what internal formative data might be viable that we could also look at between now and probably January when we come back uh, and certainly uh, some commitments around what support and those kinds of things. So we, we can come back with that. And personally, I would like to see a copy of the budget that you referred to, Mr. White, that, um, that you said was in balance. Christian, uh, Ms. Bucks, okay. I had a question. Uh, is there an ELP assigned to SCA? Do we assign ELPs? Okay. No, we do not. And so if we could do that the de before January, because again, if that's yes. that satis does not satisfy the concerns of the board, we'll need to give families enough time. So if we're look, we have two meetings in November, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So by the second meeting in November, yeah, we could probably come back to the board no later than November, which would give families enough opportunity if the closure is a recommendation, and it gives us enough time to pull together data okay. and some internal data that we feel is viable to bring before the board as well. So okay. November, um, get you information prior to the meeting. Okay, it might be helpful that if you emailed um, the, the board uh, the first week of November asking if there was, if they've had time to think about anything else that they might want. Yes, ma'am. In, in regard to that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Whew. All right, we'll move on to um, re uh, committee reports and uh, Ms. Fogg, the governance committee. So uh, we had a governance meeting uh, immediately prior to this meeting, and we discussed the privacy of student and family data. Uh, we had this discussion in large part because of the ASD's recent, um, the Achievement School District's recent request for uh, student data that would be used for marketing and recruitment purposes. And at the end of the meeting, we passed a new policy, which I will read, it's brief, uh, uh, regarding student and family data and information. Uh, the new policy reads as follows. The Metro Nashville, School, Metro Nashville Board of Public Education is committed to protecting Metro Nashville Public Schools 
student and family data and information in a secure environment and helping to maintain student and family privacy. With this in mind, the director shall ensure that MNPS student and family data and information are collected, handled, stored, and protected in accordance with the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, uh, also known as FERPA. And the director shall also not release to other school districts the directory information as defined by FERPA for any MNPS students and families. Um, we, uh, we have a deadline for responding to the Achievement School District's request, and, um, and so I, I thought that I would take this opportunity to um, discuss some of the concerns that we have about releasing student data to the ASD and um, provide an opportunity for uh, any conversation uh, that needs to be publicly um, held before we respond officially to the ASD. Um, so the ASD uh, was, uh, came into operation back in 2011. It was tasked with improving the performance of the bottom 5% schools and promised to bring them up to the top 25% in the state. Um, the, ASD, uh, has, the ASD has had higher per pupil expenditures and also small, smaller English learner populations. Um, and despite this, uh, the, the most recent data from 2015 shows as follows. Number one, the ASD has a much larger percentage of students scoring below proficient than either the state as a whole or the largest two districts, which would be Shelby County and Davidson County. Number two, the average ASD student ranks in the bottom 25% statewide in most grades and subjects. Number three, the value added gains or growth of ASD students overall are close to zero. Number four, the letter grades assigned to the ASD by the Tennessee Department of Education on the state report card indicate subpar student achievement in all three subjects tested by the TCAP, and this was based on a three-year analysis, I mean, an analysis of a three-year period. <coughs> Number five, although ASD students were predicted to be in the bottom quintile of Tennessee students, their actual scores are even lower than expected. Number six, the ASD's growth measure percentile ranked among the bottom 25% of districts in every subject and declined between 2014 and 15 as the ASD expanded at the high school grades. Number seven, while MNPS high school students generally exceeded predicted performance, ASD students were below their predicted score on end of course exam subjects. Number eight, there is significant evidence that the overall gains of ASD students across all grade levels were below the state average. And number nine, um, although the state has claimed that uh, the schools that have been in, in the Achievement School District the longest are performing better, um, this is not borne out by evidence. Four of the original six ASD schools continue to be ranked in the bottom 5% of schools in the state, and the other two of these original schools are just barely uh, above the 5% cutoff point. So that's the data back from 2015. I asked for a brief update uh, more recently. We, no, we do not have 2017 data, but uh, we did have uh, only high school data for 2016 because uh, testing was not performed on grades three through eight in 2016. Uh, from 2016, we see that there was some improvement uh, for the ASD schools in English, language arts, and U.S. history, but, there, but the growth overall in math and science was significantly below the state. Uh, the average ASD student outscores about uh, one-fourth of students statewide. The graduation rate in 2016 for high school ASD students was 40.4%, so less than half of ASD high school students are graduating, and the vast majority of those students are not college and career ready. Only 4.6% of ASD students would be considered college and career ready um, under ACT scores. Uh, so I think this makes it quite clear that the, um, the academic achievement of the ASD schools is dismal. Um, it's been an abject failure. But then on top of that problem, uh, the ASD has been found repeatedly guilty of fiscal mismanagement of taxpayer dollars 
and what, what a news source called chaotic financial management. Uh, over just a three-year period, the state comptroller identified almost three, quarter, three quarters of a million dollars in questionable costs, including reimbursements for excessive travel claims and thousands of dollars for alcohol for happy hours and office celebrations. Uh, there is uh, evidence that converting traditional schools to ASD charter schools have been disruptive and damaging to student staff and the schools. Uh, there has also been evidence that ASD schools are poorly operated. In Memphis, uh, there, was this, there were schools that were found uh, serving moldy food with rats in the cafeteria. Um, and so the question is what, you know, with the, the, with the ASD task to uh, serve the bottom 5% of schools, what is the difference between these schools and other charter schools? Um, the ASD schools are supposed to be serving a zoned population of students, and uh, they have not been able to improve performance under uh, this effort. And so their answer has been to cherry pick students in schools to help boost the ASD's performance, which was not the mission of the ASD. Here in Nashville, the ASD cherry picked an up and coming priority school, Neely's Bend, because it was the highest performing priority school in the city. And this was a hostile takeover uh, in opposition to both the district and the school itself. Um, and then oh, there's also data that indicates that um, some of the higher performing ASD schools are uh, performing better because they are now serving different students. Um, data from Brick Church showed an increase in a student achievement with a simultaneous decrease in growth scores, which is an odd anomaly that would be explained by, um, by a change in students. And so I believe this is precisely what the ASD is trying to do now. They're, they are using this request for data to cherry pick students as a way to improve the ASD's overall performance. Um, it is not in the best interest for us to provide uh, provide private student information to the ASD uh, to market to market them for uh, recruit them for failing schools. And I'll also finally just mention that the ASD has a history of misleading marketing to parents. I doubt that they would be provided this information that I've shared tonight and of turning over private student data to third parties. And, and an example is in Memphis, um, ASD gave private student data to a group called Memphis Lift, which was an organization funded by Democrats for Education Reform, uh, which is actually a, uh, an organization backed by hedge fund investors. And at the time, Democrats for Education Reform was operated by Natasha Kamrani, the wife of Chris Barbic, who was the opera head of the SD at the time. He was he later resigned when he was unable to produce results. Um, so I, I just there I do I do not think that there is um, a legitimate student interest. Uh, it is not the best interest of students turnover data to the ASD. And uh, I believe that we have an obligation to protect the privacy of that data and pr to protect families from predatory <coughs> marketing tactics. If anyone else would like to comment. No. Uh, did you have a comment? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So with um, that, then we will adjourn the um, board meeting and um, go into our work session. Even though we've lost a couple of colleagues, we still have a quorum, so. Um, yes. I would just think on, on, on that last discussion, it might be helpful just for the public if um, Ms. Harkey could just uh, communicate the uh, legal interpretation difference that we have had because the question, the question centers around, you know, you know, state law, you know, communicates that um, we, they have the right to the data, but the position that the board is taking deals more with federal law, right, and our ability to interpret FERPA. So if you could just clarify that so we know what the actual yeah. issue is that the greater public would understand what that was, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so I do want to say that this will be a recommendation coming out of the committee. So it will be on the board floor for final vote in early September. Um, and, and in terms of FERPA or in terms of our argument, um, <laughs> that there it's, it's really twofold. But the, the main part is that under FERPA, a district can specify to whom and for what purpose directory information is going to be made available. And so it, this, is, this is the board specifying to whom um, directory information will be made available, specifically saying it would not be made available for to the to outside 
charter or to outside districts. Um, so that, that will be our argument and, and really with the understanding that this Tennessee state code that went into existence and started became effective July 1, 2017, it specifically allows or requires that the um, provision of the student data uh, student contact information be provided in accordance with FERPA. And so we would be using FERPA, um, which which would trump over that state law. Additionally, um, it's also, there's an argument that the state statute says to effectuate section 4913.113, which is specifically the enrollment section under the charter law. Um, this is not for enrollment purposes. This is for marketing and recruiting by which the ASD has made that request. So for those two reasons, um, the, the board has decided not to provide this information to the ASD. And certainly our policy will reflect that going forward. Thank you, Ms. Harkin. Thank you for the clarity. All right. So Dr. Joseph, we're on our, our work session and um, MMPS next. <coughs> Yes, at this time, I'll ask uh, uh, Mr. Chris Henson and Dr. Dana Carlisle uh, to come up, and uh, they are going to continue the discussion with us uh, regarding our MNPS Next. Again, our so they'll review the goals of MNPS Next, and they will uh, communicate some of the work and findings that we've found, uh, allow the board to have an opportunity to discuss uh, some of the findings that are uh, will be presented tonight uh, to the public, and then uh, we will discuss our next steps in relation to this. Okay, I'm going to run through the uh, the deck. We reviewed it with um, many of you. A lot of these these data points, and Mr. Henson's going to have uh, field questions from you. We, what we would like to be able to do is to have you ask us questions, just as you just did, uh, Mr. Queen, and to pause and, and take those questions along the way. Uh, just quickly, we're going, you all have a, a deck in front of you, but we're going to uh, go through a quick recap of what MNPS Next Phase 1's purpose, goals, steps, and process was intended to be, summary of community engagement findings, summary of research findings of some key district data that are relevant, summary of initial scenarios, uh, initial observations, and then next steps. And then also if you have additional questions at the end after we've gone through all the pieces, and we'll do this as rapidly as possible. Uh, so just to review, we were looking at lower declining enrollment, school choice transition team committee report, which recommended uh, several things about uh, grade configuration, particularly considering moving fifth grade, uh, evolving demographics and gentrification throughout uh, Davidson County are changing, and then fiscal realities and constraints are, were all part of the context in which we launched this project. Uh, some of the issues or the problems that this project seeks to address, uh, the quality of academic programs across the district, student access to high quality academic programs across the district, the learning environments uh, that provide academic and social and emotional support to our most at risk students, parental perception about safety and security and developmental appropriateness of middle school grade configurations, student flight from MNPS, traditional public schools over the course of elementary and up to middle, uh, and actually it's also through high school, better utilization of space and capital operating resources, and then also student mobility. So these were a number of the things uh, that we were, seek were seeking to address through MNPS next. Uh, the scope, if you recall, what we did was uh, be chunk or break the work into phases. And we started with elementary school and middle, specifically determining the feasibility of moving fifth grade to elementary uh, schools to help address student attrition between elementary and middle and, and also performance. And we did that because, again, it allowed us to break the analysis into phases. Uh, there are many more elementary and middle schools than um, there are secondary schools are high, and making the decision about what would happen there first made, made logistical sense. Uh, we also wanted to address under and over capacity MNPS elementary and middle schools, 
possibly align our schools to the way in which Tennessee standards, accountability measures, and teacher certification requirements are organized, possibly align our schools to national norms for elementary and middle schools, and then possibly align our grade configuration to those of surrounding counties and private schools, and then also test and respond to parent preference. Again, the goals, overall goals, improve student outcomes, increase resource fiscal and fiscal efficiencies, and market share uh, and desirability for MNPS schools. We had nine phases in this first phase, excuse me, nine steps in this first phase one, uh, and now uh, between July and August, we were developing scenarios, uh, and then in August, uh, bringing uh, to you some ideas for decision making. This, this slide is not legible as presented, but what it basically shows are those phases uh, and, a, and a flow of when we would seek community engagement and uh, the scenarios. The middle section showed the data and these data priorities to consider are what was in that middle section of that graphic. And so these are all the kinds of data sets that we take into account and have taken into account in addition to the community engagement or along with the community engagement information. Quickly, to summarize the community engagement findings, uh, we pared down the community engagement. There was both an online survey and then four uh, sessions in each quadrant of, of the county. Uh, and we looked at what did parents say, and 40% of the respondents were parents. Uh, and of those parents, there's a pretty even split in terms of whether or not parents feel that grade configuration contributes to student achievement. 75% uh, of parents uh, favor a K-5 grade configuration. However, only 29% of parents favored adding pre-K instead of adding fifth grade, for example. Uh, the option of adding pre-K and fifth grade to elementary grade appealed to 60% of parents. And then uh, almost two-thirds or two-thirds of parents opposed a pre-K or a K pre-K-8 or a K-8 grade configuration. So there was not much support for the K-8. And then 70% believed that a K-5 grade configuration would positively impact student achievement. Also, 51%, so it's about, of parents believe that a pre-K, K or K-8 configuration would have a negative impact on student achievement, while only 21% believed it would have a positive impact. So they didn't just not like the idea, they also thought it could be detrimental. Uh, parents were split on how grade configuration impacts their decision to enter or remain in MNPS schools. And then the most important point is when asked which factors had the strongest influence on a family's decision not to enroll or stay in an MNPS school, parents ranked uh, quality of program the highest, then safety program offering, and then tra and transportation. So I just wanna pause there and see, we, we've reviewed, you've seen the, these data in different forms, if, if there are any questions that any of you have at this point, or if there's anything you think we should consider uh, in future messaging, community engagement se sessions, or analyses. Yes. I'll just renew my request to consider high school start times. Okay. Anybody else? So are you asking specifically around the Around the community the engagement data, yeah, because we're gonna, we're, okay. yeah. So I think one of the things, and I may have mentioned this before, that's really important is to reiterate that this was um, a bringing together of people discuss the feasibility of it, not to determine how to get it done um, and, and what the impact was. So I think that that just needs to continue to be our, our leading message um, so that we you know, remind, and I don't know what the phrase was we use, give ourselves permission to, <laughs> to move on to something that's more, um, so the, the, the community data is great. It's, it's a reflection of what people think um, is best for their kids. Um, I think as we talked about it in the room in our last meeting, the, 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 the risk of, because of capacity issues, the risk of having a negative impact on our push for equity is very high. Um, and so I, I think our messaging needs to be also bring with it the, the, ne the unintended or the negative consequences of moving forward at this point. Um, 
And so whether that's replacing that, that energy around with high school start times or giving ourselves permission to say we've got enough on our plate <laughs> right now um, of things that are in motion and in play that need to go well. We have a lot of things that must go well this year um, and, and burning calories on uh, other options and possibilities until we've stabilized may not again be the best use of resources. We need to quit doing things um, that, that take our attention away from the, you know, the ball. You know, we keep taking our eyes off the ball, chasing hypotheticals and potentials that really aren't going to get us what we need in the short term, because we've got some short term wins that we're chasing right now that we have to achieve. We've made huge investments um, in our central office and our staff and in resources. Um, so this is the year to say now we've made the changes, we brought the bodies in, we've got to now prove that the, the, the infrastructure changes and decisions we've made and invested in are going to yield the results at the lowest level, which is in the classroom. So that would be my thing, it is to remind people of what we were doing, tell them the, other, the, the, the ugly truths we've uncovered as we've delved into this discussion, and give ourselves permission to table it, close it, push it aside, and re, um, reiterate our commitment to focusing on all that, you know, what the people said, we got more on our plate than we can say grace over right now. <laughs> and we don't, we don't want any side dishes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I mean, it's just we heard that we also heard the people loud and clear that the quality of the schools is the most important. And if we do not believe that uh, just changing one grade configuration is going to make drastic improvements there, um, not to mention just the cost, not just the, the, the money cost, but also you know, what it would take to move those students and zone boundaries and everything else. So I'd, again, we did, we were tasked to say the feasibility, we have done that, and I, and I do believe it is time to refocus back on keeping the main thing the main thing, and it's getting our schools where they need to be quality-wise. All right, the next section was on a summary of the research findings, and this really, the primary conclusion is that there's not a lot of difference between, we don't know, the research doesn't study K-4 versus K-5, has studied K-8s, and, uh, but the research overall talks about the fewer number of transitions students make, the better they perform academically. That's the most salient piece. And then uh, what really makes a difference is the academic health, mental health, and other services that support student learning and healthy development, access to an array of curricular and extracurricular activities, and a fair share of resources, uh, financial resources from our various funding sources. So that's, in a nutshell, was the summary of the research. Again, if there's, if there's anything else that you want us to think about as we uh, uh, continue our analysis uh, with MNPS next, not necessarily just looking at the fifth grade, but messaging and future engagement sessions, is there anything from the research that, that you would want us, that you have questions about that you think we should emphasize? I think it's it would be important to point out that even though the recommendation was to look at K through five, there's nothing that says that K through five is what we should be doing. So I think that's the big takeaway there. Okay, some key district data for um, you to think about. Uh, do you want to talk about this? One? Sure. Okay. So we've uh, put some information on this slide to, to give you an idea. When we talk about our capital budget and our, uh, there's a difference, as you know, between our requested capital improvement budget and what we actually receive through the capital spending plan. And what you have here would be what we've actually received through the capital spending plan going back to 2013-14. You can see how much we've received in construction of school-specific projects and then how much we've received on district-wide projects. Uh, and what the total approved amount was through that capital spending plan. You also have below that what the request was in year one of our capital improvement budget request. Starting in 2013-14, going to 2014-15, 2015-16, and then 2016-17, uh, and then 
what we just most recently um, received through the capital spending plan, the $82 million, you can see that our request in that first year capital improvement budget was $278 million. We're very appreciative of what we have been receiving through our capital funding uh, from the mayor and from the Metro Council. But you can see uh, when we start talking about uh, being realistic as it relates to how much uh, capital funding we've requested and how much capital funding we've actually received. And then just a, a note there at the bottom, we have some very large projects coming uh, in the near future. Uh, we've got uh, in the middle of the Hillsboro project, uh, we have a Hillwood project coming up, of course, Hillwood High School, and then a new Nashville School of the Arts. And so we just wanted to, to lay that out there to, to, as a reminder that we have some really, really large capital uh, budget requests that we will be making in the very near future. And so we, we did look at research as it relates to school size, and there's varying research, but uh, what we have uh, looked at is our facilities folks uh, in combination with uh, our uh, other uh, folks in the district and our consultants, we looked at a preferred capacity of each tier. Uh, the elementary uh, preferred capacity would be between 400 and 800. What we've found is that when you start getting below 400, uh, it becomes uh, more difficult to, to be able to offer the, the program offerings. Uh, it, it requires, in many cases, some supplemental funding so that the uh, school can, can actually function. Uh, middle school, you can see 500 to 1,000, and then high school, uh, 1,200 to 2,400. Um, you see those boxes there where we are allocating additional funds uh, to schools, whether they have uh, fewer than 300 students. We have 22 of those schools where we're allocating in our budget $7.7 .7 million over and above what they would typically receive in their student-based budgeting allocation. And for our 17 schools between 300 and 400 students, we're allocating an additional $3.5 million to those schools. What, what this chart shows you is uh, the outflux or the enrollment trends. It's actually the survival rate, which means the percentage of students who stay at, after each grade level. Uh, and the, you, you have a corrected version. Um, the actual total number of high school students that are lost is 1,000. Um, 115, uh, but you can see that we do lose uh, students uh, at every grade level of throughout, and it um, really gets the highest at grade five, uh, and then again it, it ha happens in, in high school. Uh, but we wanted you to see that that this this trend go is is something that continues throughout the whole K-12 experience. Yeah, so any questions you have? Yeah. Are, the, are these numbers like by year? So you people are still moving between 11th and 12th? Like there's yes. like a lot of movement at 10th grade even? Yes. Is that correct? Well, freshmen. So um, this shows five years of enrollment history based in October, which is the standard month for each of the past five years. On the right-hand side, you see a three-year average. That's called a cohort survival ratio. So what that is measuring is how many students progress from grade to grade to grade as a cohort all the way through each <coughs> tier level. So, so does high school then imply that you might have more students being maintained in ninth grade? Yes. They have so retained. so yeah. whether high school is, is a peculiar grade, um, you see that the ninth grade is so much larger than the 10th grade that that could be simplified to explain as retention, but it may not always be retention because sometimes a high school student might just be taking a single ninth grade class over again. They might actually be on track to graduate and how you actually count them, whether you count them as a ninth grader or a 10th grader, in this data, there's more students flagged as ninth graders, but a lot of those are reoccurring ninth grade students. And that's not to say that, that I guess they've maybe been fully retained, but it might just be one course they're retaking. So, so the we really the K through eight data are what we wanted you to look at in terms of how you know what 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 do students what does student movement look like K eight and uh, we. 
added also the high school data, but that might be a little bit confusing. I apologize for that. Are there other questions or any uh, points you think that, again, we, you, you would want us to emphasize going forward from, from the, these data points? And then we're gonna next go into the scenarios uh, and the drivers and the criteria that were established. I'm gonna take that as no questions. So when uh, beginning to look at scenarios, and if you recall what this meant is, all right, we've asked questions, we've looked at data, we have a, uh, a lot of different data sets. H how do we assemble that so we can begin uh, to reflect on what are the pros and cons associated with a particular situation or scenario? Uh, so some of the drivers were moving fifth grade to be with elementary grades, adding space at elementary schools, consolidating pre-Ks to create space in elementary schools, rezoning, middle school consolidation, balancing the distribution of special programs, and repurposing middle schools as elementary schools or special program facilities. Uh, the criteria we used, uh, we established moving did, did we actually, were we able to move fifth grade students? Uh, did it increase program equity and access? Uh, did it align with our diversity management plan, increase student achievement, maximize facility use efficiency, increase financial efficiency? Uh, it, would it be desirable to the community based on some of the data we just looked at? Um, and does it use financial resources reasonably? So the, the, the five different scenarios that we modeled, uh, again, we were looking at the feasibility of moving fifth grade. Uh, the first one was moving fifth grade to elementary buildings, repurposing under-enrolled middle school buildings, adding space to elementary buildings, and relocating some programs. The second one was similar, but it had taking pre-Ks out of existing, where, where they were in elementary schools and consolidating those into quadrant-based centers. The third one uh, was also similar to the first two, uh, but it included rezoning uh, to balance and diversify enrollment. So three is essentially similar to one. It doesn't take pre-K out, but it did look at rezoning to balance and diversify enrollment. Number four uh, rezoned, but did look at taking pre-K out. And then the fifth model that we looked at was uh, repurposing elementary and middle school buildings as pre-K-8 and as K-8 buildings. It would require rezoning to balance and diversify enrollment and um, balancing special programs across quadrants. And we looked at the K-8 scenario because research did indicate that, there, that uh, academic achievement would improve as a result. Um, so. What we discovered uh, was the construction cost, regardless of the scenario, would be several hundreds of millions of dollars. The estimated 300 million would be in addition to what is currently planned for NSA, Hillsborough, and Hillwood, uh, which may not be feasible or fiscally doable to uh, look at embarking on a $300 million project that doesn't take in yet consideration of other uh, major projects. The needed facility renovations could take at least five years, which would require long-term political support stretching over Merrill board and council terms. Rezoning options may not be popular. Moving pre-K out of elementary buildings did not gain us much in terms of space. The K-8 scenario, while research-based, and better utilizes all of our space, would still require the, 700, the several hundred million uh, dollar construction investment. Uh, while we did not formally model using por portables, we do know that we would need to add portables uh, to accommodate fifth grades in our currently overcrowded areas of the district to those elementary sites. And we also know that some elementary sites would not be able to accommodate portables. So again, to pause and just, uh, uh, I, know, I know some of you already raised some of the points that might have stemmed from that discovery, uh, but if, do you have additional points that you'd like to make or questions or considerations uh, as we move forward? 
My only question uh, was one of the points you made was to try to the K-5 uh, move would be um, you'd be considering surrounding counties. So what's the configuration of surrounding counties, the majority of our surrounding counties? Is it K-5? Yeah, I believe the, the majority would be K-5 for elementary schools. And of course, uh, a lot of the, the state testing, uh, they have cutoffs typically, uh, you know, three grades three through five and then grades six through eight. So some of, some of the um, uh, data that we currently use, whether it be testing or whether it be teacher certifications or uh, as, as you indicated, just some of our surrounding counties, they, they typically do have a K-5 model, even though as we've said, Research doesn't particularly show that there's any advantage to having a K-4 or a K-5 model as it relates to student achievement. I just and I think, I'm, I think the, the research doesn't show it because the research hasn't studied it because we are an anomaly. You know, K-4 K, K is, is not a typical structure. Uh, okay, any other, we can go on to our observations. Uh, so basically we've studied moving fifth grade to be with other elementary grades to see if it's feasible. Um, we know that uh, it's desired by parents. Uh, we know that it makes sense given accountability, certification, academic standards, and common national practices. Um, it isn't supported one way or another by the research. Um, while we could move K-5s by using portables, portables are expensive and neither aesthetically pleasing nor welcomed by staff and parents. It would cost more than past annual capital budgets have indicated is supportable. Its cost would compete with other capital projects. Uh, moving fifth grade could require us to rezone. And again, it would take at least five years to implement even if we were able to increase our annual capital budgets. Uh, so, uh, lastly, here's what we're suggesting in terms of next steps, is that we postpone the four September community engagement sessions. We survey the community regarding the cost estimates for moving fifth grade. We begin a phase 1B to examine and model by October shorter term solutions tailored to address each quadrant's needs to help us better manage elementary and middle capacity, enrollment, academic needs, and social and emotional supports. We, um, we were supposed to have had an advisory committee meeting yesterday to pre precede this, but it's scheduled for later this month because we rescheduled due to the eclipse. Uh, so we'd want to seek feedback from the advisory committee, share in uh, information with the board once we've done this additional uh, efficiency modeling, if you will. Standardize the junctures at which students change schools and make choices. Reschedule the community engagement sessions to occur in October to share the information that's more specific regarding the short-term solutions. Continue, obviously, to find ways to improve student access to comp comparable extracurricular and academic program offerings regardless of where one lives or their access to transportation. Make sure we're clear about what our middle schools do have to offer. Uh, for example, band in fifth grade, the new STEAM focus continue fi to find ways to bolster middle school program programming via S STEAM, fifth grade academies, and other things that have yet to be identified. Uh, develop capital budget to support implementation of recommendations from phase 1A and 1B, and then move on to phase two, which is looking at high schools. Uh, so just give you the opportunity for additional comments or questions. I, uh, I know Ms. Dr. Gentry, you talked earlier about let's move on. We've, 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 we've looked at the feasibility of fifth grade. Just want to, uh, from those next steps, do those, do those make sense? Do they yes, I'm confused about number two and number three. So number two seems to go, unless I'm reading it wrong, seems to suggest we go back and survey some more about the fifth grade option, while number two, three seems to, in, well, I'm inferring from number three that we're going to move beyond the fifth, fifth, move in fifth grade and look at the other things that we actually have at our disposal currently to improve and better manage the capacity, improve the fifth grade experience, smooth out that transition from elementary to middle school, 
start to elevate and better market what we're doing in the fifth grade around the STEAM work and talk more, you know, unless I'm confused. It could be both and, or it, it, if your guidance is to say, let's make a decision right now not to continue looking at the f moving fifth grade and, and communicate instead that we've looked at this and that we're moving on from it, then, for example, we could strike number two. Yeah, I just feel like we're asking for the sake of asking at this point, because we already know. We already know it has a price tag associated with it that we can't afford, that we have asks that we will be putting forth in the capital needs space that to satisfy commitments we've already made. And so we're, again, I think we're adding something to the mix that is not going to get approved, and then we're going to look like we're making a choice to do something that, to not do something that we said we we're going to do, right? Because we keep going down this road too far. So I'm, I'm, again, I, my thought individually is that we get rid of number two and we start to focus on telling the story about why this reconfiguration doesn't really support the bigger things that are going on in MNPS financially uh, or programmatically. Because I think one of the other things I share with you is that I'm concerned when parents say, I want more pro equitable programming. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I want to have band at every school? I want to have, you know, string instruments at every school? Or I want to have, you know, calculus? I, I don't know that they, they separate academic programs like academies and courses and AP offerings from volleyball and mime classes. Okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think your, your, your comments are, are well taken. I think we were thinking along the lines of, um, you know, because this was so uh, of interest to the public, how do we educate them to make sure they understand the, the cost amount now that this is the first time in the public space that we've put out the fact that this would be a $300 million venture on top of the $300 million and things we already have going. Um, so to do it would, would be multi-year, um, would you, um, would include portables and other things associated, like do you understand what the ask is? You know, we've investigated it and so we wanted to, the thought was to, to, to give that information and, and go on an education on this is what we found because the reality is probably most of our community members don't um, view board meetings. And, unless, and even if it's even if it's in the paper um, or on the television screen, they don't they don't see it. So, uh, how do we go about getting out there that we did answer the question that everybody's saying we want fifth grade? Get them that information and then come back and move on. So so we don't have a communications dilemma if we just move on after today and people say, well. Whatever happened to fifth grade? Why didn't they? Yeah, didn't I'm not saying that? we don't go back and tell the story yeah. and give. Well, I think we put a bow on this. Definitely, we don't just abandon it and never mention it again. I think we put a bow on it, but I think we, we need to be practitioners of, of what we preach. So one of the other things we've been hearing a lot about is we need to tell our story better. And so we've done a lot of work. And so we've done a lot of work in fifth grade space. So one of the questions I asked Jana when she did the one on ones with each of us was, "What's the problem we're trying to solve with this?" Because I'm still not quite sure. I know we're responding to a request. We're responding to community feedback gave, gathered by the transition. I want to see fifth grade moved to the elementary tier. That's not solving a problem. That's responding to a request. So again, as the you know academicians and those that are experts in K through 12 education, what do we believe, looking at the big picture, is the right thing to do? And understanding that that ask to move to research looking at fifth grade to elementary tier was separate from what we've done with the STEAM work and other initiatives that we've done to improve the middle school experience. So again, when we go back to tell what we believe is the right or not the right thing to do in the fifth grade shift, we need to tell the story about what we have done. Because again, parents are responding to my kids not having a good fifth grade experience. So maybe you ought to put them back in the elementary school tier. So, so what I hear you um, suggesting is that we, we communicate that we've ruled it out. I just want to see nods or concurrence yes. on the part of the, the board members that yes, that that's the step we should take. That we improve. Okay, so the nods are recorded as. <laughs> so, Janet, when you had uh, the, the meetings with uh, my colleagues, did you, did you ask them, you know, what they thought about that idea and about moving it back? Um, at that, t at that this, point, this time? meeting is an opportunity for you to publicly okay. provide right. guidance to us to, right. to indicate that um, that 
that you concur with the, that the 300 million is a non-starter yeah. uh, and that we move on to looking at some of the other kind of things. Well, I think you're getting nods from everybody. Okay. Can we nod, can we get the nods on the TV? How committed were we to <laughs> the right. transition team? Uh, were, did we have to commit to their suggestion? No. Well, so, their suggestion was just to yeah, look at it, right. and we've done that. Right. We've, done, we've done the feasibility. Yeah. And the, my emphasis should, I think the emphasis should be a, the quality of our programs. Okay. So um, that was number one in the issues to address. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know, Dr. Gentry, you've asked for what we were trying to solve for, and quality of academic programs does come up first, and we, uh, we will move on, and we will think about uh, how we, what, how we tell our story, what story we tell, and why it makes sense for us to look more broadly at, not at grade configuration specifically, but at quality of program. All right, and I think alongside like that. the sky's open <laughs> for us, yeah. so. But to make sure that we are doing those short-term evaluations of the best you know, most efficient use of the, of the buildings that we have. And so it doesn't mean that there won't be other decisions or options, scenarios that roll from this, but it's just that, yes, we are, we are saying that we think it's time to move on from the fifth grade discussion. Right, and so if you, um, uh, there was a suggestion in the next steps to have a 1B, which is, to, is moving on. So basically in the next steps, you're, we'll get rid of number two, but it will be messaging and sharing information about our story and our thinking, uh, and we'll begin to move on to looking at the other ways in which we can uh, uh, address some of the capacity and enrollment issues, as well as clearly the academic program uh, and access to those program issues. Okay, I think then we have what we need to go forward. Is there anything else you, you want us to think about? Thank you. I would just, just add quickly that um, I think in the discussions about moving fifth grade, one of the concerns that was raised was safety of students. And so maybe in addition to addressing quality of programming, we might yes. provide to parents our um, yeah. ideas about how we can ensure that students are safe and fifth grade. And I think it's an opportunity for us to address concerns that were raised in general, even if we decide not to move fifth grade back. Right. Thank so. you. Yep. Thank you very much. Anything else? Well, I see my colleague, Ms. Bugs, has absconded her seat. So Mary's got it. Do we have announcements or? Oh, oh, we do have announcements. I'm sorry, that's my bad. And we, can you start? Sure. Um, just uh, the long-awaited Hillsborough High School groundbreaking is tomorrow at 11 o'clock. So uh, hopefully it won't be raining like this. Yeah. <laughs> Southeast Community Center, oh, I'm sorry, um, Antioch, Percy Priest, Cane Ridge area will be having a meet and greet at the Southeast Community Center on September 9th at 10 o'clock a.m. and that's a Saturday morning. <laughs> Brandon, Dr. Gentry? Yep. Miss Bugs. Okay. Be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> 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 <laughs>